Welcome to this video about inductors, part of the electromagnetism unit for advanced tyre physics. So these are the things that we're going to be talking about during this video, uh, lifted from the advanced tyre physics course notes, in terms of the things that you need to know about, and some of the uh, examples or investigations. So what is an inductor? Well, an inductor quite simply is a coil of wire. Um, the inductor has a symbol that you can see there at the top and some inductors have an iron core and to represent this with the symbol, we put the line above the uh, curves which indicate the coils of wire. So anything with a coils of wire is an inductor. And there's a picture of one. Um, they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. In this demonstration, we've got a slightly higher voltage. We're now up to 12 volts DC. Um, we've got a large inductor, two light bulbs. Just show you the circuit that we've got here. So power supply, 12 volts there. And you've got one lamp that's in series with a resistor. The second lamp is in series with an inductor. Both the two lamps are connected in parallel with the 12 volt supply. Push switch activates the two lamps in parallel. So before I switch on, just consider what you think you're going to see in terms of when I apply the push switch and give the supply to both bulbs. I'm going to turn this around so you can see it more easily from that angle there and just zoom in a little bit. Okay, so press the switch. If you look carefully, one bulb lights just before the other. And the bulb that is lighting before the other is the one that's directly connected to the resistor. So this was the circuit that we had and we can see that the one that is connected to the resistor lights slightly before the one that is connected to the inductor. Uh, we can be asked to explain why this happens. So here's our explanation. So when we close the switch, we get a changing current. So it goes from no current to a large current. And this induces a changing magnetic field in the inductor. This changing magnetic field produces what we call a back EMF, which opposes the initial EMF that we have and it takes slightly longer for the switch to switch on. If we looked at opening the switch then we would have the opposite situation. When we open the switch again we go from a large current this time to very small current so we've got a large rate of change of current which induces a changing magnetic field. The changing magnetic field in produces a back EMF that means that our light would stay on for a little bit longer. So an inductor is a coil of wire. It behaves in some respects like a capacitor because it can store energy within the magnetic field of the inductor. Um, the ideal inductor has no resistance at all. This is not strictly speaking entirely correct, but for the purposes of our calculations, we assume it has no resistance whatsoever. And it works when we have an increase or a decrease in the current, so a growth or decay of a magnetic field. Um, when we looked at electromagnetism and generation of electricity, which is touched a tiny bit in National 5, more in National 4 and S3, then we were talking about induction uh, and inductors. So this is what we looked at earlier on in your physics learning we had a coil of wire and we had a magnet and if we got relative motion between the coil and the magnet then we can induce a voltage within that coil of wire and this is how uh, dynamos work or generators work and if we move the magnet faster or the relative motion between the magnet and the coil of wire more then we get a greater induced current or voltage if we have a greater number of turns on the coil we get a greater induced voltage. If we have a stronger magnet, we also get a greater voltage. 
Okay, this is called self-inductance of the coil because we don't have any external supply. So at advanced time, we look at AC and DC circuits, but we're going to consider DC circuits in this video. So here's our circuit with a cell and a current and our inductor. And when we close and we get a current, we get a magnetic field that's been produced within that coil of wire. And the bit we're particularly interested in is when it turns on, there's a change in current, and so we get a changing magnetic field. And where we have a changing magnetic field, just like when we had our magnet going through the coil of wire, that in turn induces an EMF of voltage. Um, that EMF opposes the change in current. That's why we call it a back EMF. So, and this is Lenz's law, which says that the induced EMF in a coil will always po oppose the change that causes it. So if we're looking at um, how the current increases, then there'll be a back EMF opposing that increase in current. If we're looking at opening the switch and the current decreasing, then there'll be a back EMF opposing the decrease in the current. So it always opposes the change that we have. That's why it's called a back EMF. OK, there's a link to another video that describes a little bit more about what's going on in terms of the current when the current flows and the field that is generated. We can change the inductance of an inductor by adding more coils of wire or we can add a core, uh, either an iron core, which we deal with in this course, or other uh, iron like materials as well. So let's have a look at how we would investigate what's happening to the current. Well, we would have a circuit like this one where we've got our inductor and our resistor in series. We have a switch, we have a supply of DC voltage, a battery, and we have an interface, a data logger uh, connected across because we want to look at how the voltage or the current change over time. So we need a data logger to be able to uh, look at that properly. What we end up with is we end up with a graph of current against time like the one on the right here. So we get a rapid change in current, but it isn't instantaneous. So we might expect when we close a switch that we, the current would just go from nothing to on. That's not true. It takes a little bit of time to do that, and that's because of the uh, inductance of the inductor in the circuit. So when we turn something on, there's a large rate and change of current. This is the gradient of a current time graph like this one. This large rate of change of current causes a large changing magnetic field, which induces a back EMF across the coil, the inductor. And the back EMF slows the rate of change of current, which causes the back EMF to decrease and the gradient decreases eventually the gradient becomes zero when the current reaches its maximum value at the moment we switched on the back emf is equal and opposite to the supply voltage we can also look at um, when we switch circuits off so we've got the same graph there showing the curve increasing to the switched on graph and then we've got a switched off part of the graph too so it's taking time to go down to zero because the back emf opposing that changing current that's there um, in some respects these graphs are similar to the graphs for a capacitor although there are some differences If we increase the inductance of our inductor, then it will take longer for the current to reach a maximum. So we'll get the bottom curve on the graph here instead of the top one. So we're talking about this line here at the bottom for our large inductance. And so when we are opening the switch, expecting the current to go to zero, if we've got a larger inductance, then it takes longer for that change to get to zero. And so we've got a graph like the yellow one as opposed to the other graph. So you can be asked to, to compare what the two graphs might be look like in the same way that you would do it for graphs of different resistance in the circuit for a capacitance resistor circuit.
So Lenz's law says that the induced EMF, the back EMF, always opposes the change in the current, and that the back EMF will be the same as the EMF of the source that the inductor is connected to. Because it opposes it, it's sometimes called a choke. Okay, so a reminder that the back EMF is the EMF that opposes the change in current in the circuit. It just depends whether we're closing the switch and we're having an increase in current and it's opposing the increase in the current or we're opening a switch and it's opposing the decrease in current. So the unit of inductance is the Henry and this is defined as the uh, ratio of the back EMF to the rate of change of current, di by dt. So more commonly, the expression is given as in the blue box there, that the EMF is equal to minus L, so that's minus the inductance L, times di by dt. di by dt is the rate of change of current. <clears throat> or in terms of defining it, we can rearrange that relationship to give us the inductance being equal to minus the back EMF divided by the rate of change of current. So an inductance of one Henry, the plural being Henry's, is when an EMF of one volt is applied across an inductor and induces a rate of change of current of one ampere per second. So we've got minus one volts is equal to minus one times the rate of change of one. Okay, Henry is the unit for inductance, but it's possible to use other units as well. There's ohm seconds or there's volts seconds per amp. Okay, quick look at Lenz's law from the point of view of conservation of energy. We know that the law of conservation of energy says we cannot create or destroy energy. We just change it, transform it from one different form to another one. And because we can't create energy for nothing, this is one of the reasons why the induced back EMF must be in the opposite direction to the original EMF. Because if it isn't, if it was in the same direction, then we'd be getting additional energy from nothing. Okay, as the source has to do some work to move the charges around the induction coil, this work appears in the form of energy of the magnetic field. Um, later in the next video, we'll be calculating the energy in an inductor. Um, so the energy stored in that magnetic field can be quite large, and that is used to um, light up. So a small source of EMF, a one and a half volt cell, can then light up a bulb that requires a much higher voltage for a short period of time. Um, same principle applies in your car. The alternator in your car, the starter motor in your car is basically an inductor. So there's lots of energy stored in the magnetic field of the inductor. And then all of that is released to ignite the uh, petrol and get the car started. There are a number of ways that we can calculate the inductance of an inductor. Um, we can do this experimentally. We can measure the back EMF and the rate of change of current and look at the gradient. There'll be an example about this too. Um, there's a video of this experiment in the middle there. I'll post a link to that as well so you can take a look. And as we said before, the ideal inductor um, is calculated with negligible resistance. If we want to work out the current within the circuit, then since we've got a resistor in the circuit, we can work out the current using Ohm's law in the usual way. So let's look at an example. So we have a circuit with an inductor and a resistor and a switch in, and the EMF of our battery is 10 volts. The resistance of our resistor is five ohms. And at a particular point in time, after we close the switch, we have a current of 0.5 amperes. But the current is still changing then, and it's changing at a rate of 50 amperes per second. Of course, it's not going to take very long time, so it's not meaning that we got large currents. We've just got a large rate change of current because it's gone going from zero to our maximum current of 0.5 amps afterwards. So we're asked to calculate the potential difference across the resistor. So 
So the potential difference across the resistor can be calculated from the information given in the question in the usual way in that potential difference is equal to current times resistance. So we have the current 0.5 amps times the resistance 5 to give us 2.5 volts at that particular moment in time. We were then asked to consider the potential difference across the inductor. So the inductor and the resistor are connected in series and therefore the potential differences add up. So if there's two and a half volts across the inductor, there will be the remaining 7.5 volts from the 10 volts supplied by the battery across the inductor. Now we want to calculate the inductance of the inductor. So we have a relationship uh, e equals EMF equals minus L di by dt. And if we substitute the numbers into our relationship, we can work out that it is 0 0.15 Henry's. Let's look at another example. So we've got our circuit that we can use to investigate the inductance. And this time we've got an interface and the interface allows us to plot a graph of the current against time from when we close the switch. And we're asked to state the back EMF to use the graph of current against time to work out the rate of change of current and then work out the self inductance of the coil and the resistance of the resistor that we have in the circuit. OK, so state the back EMF. Well, the back EMF will be the same as the EMF of whatever is our source of EMF in the circuit. So the back EMF will be minus 12 volts. We can either put 12 volts if we're explicit that it's a back EMF or we can put minus 12 volts as our response. So we then have our graph that's given to us showing the current in milliamps and the time in milliseconds. And we're asked to work out the rate of change of current when the switch is closed. So what we're looking at is the gradient of the graph at the origin of it. OK, so the best way to work out the gradient of the graph is to draw it. So we have our graph of current against time from when we've closed the switch. And we're measuring the current in milliamps and the time in milliseconds, which is why we need our data logger to collect this data to produce the graph that we've got there. So we're looking for the rate of change of current when the switch is closed. So to do that, we take our graph and we draw on a line at a tangent to the curve of the graph at the origin. So that'll be somewhere like the red line is at the time because we've obviously got a curve so it's difficult to work out graph of a curve the only the gradient of a curve unless we've got the relationship for it so the only way we can do that is to draw a tangent to that line there then we can look at the points that it happens to go through and i've selected at 15 milliseconds and i can read off my graph value there so you should be looking at the numbers that particularly uh, correspond to the the points that cross over on the on the graph there okay and it happens that the other point the other coordinate is at zero there so i can say that's going to be the gradient of 64 over 15 and both are in milliseconds and that gives us gradient of 4.3 amperes per second so we're then asked to work out the self-inductance of the coil so since the emf is equal to minus l di by dt and we've just had di by dt we can substitute in to work out that it's 2.8 henry's and finally we're asked to work out the resistance of the resistor well the final steady current is given 96 milliamps and we know that the voltage across the resistor at that time will be all of the supply voltage from the cell so we get 125 ohms OK, so one final example. So we have an inductor with an iron core of 0 0.4 Henry's connected in series with an 18 ohm resistor to a 9 volt DC supply with a switch and an ammeter in the circuit. The switch is closed and we're asked to sketch a graph of current and against time, giving numerical values on the current axis. 
so we're going from zero current to the maximum current. We can use Ohm's law to work out the maximum current. So maximum current is going to be the nine volts divided by the 18 ohms, which is 0 0.5. And the shape of our graph is going to be this curved kind of shape. OK, so we're going to have a sketch graph that looks like that. Remember, even when you join sketch graphs, you should include the origin and you should include some units on each one. OK, whether you put seconds or milliseconds wouldn't really matter um, in the same way that amps or milliamps doesn't really matter either. OK, and we just asked for a num numerical value on the current axis. So we're going to put our maximum value at being 0 0.5 amperes and we're asked to explain the shape of the graph so the large rate of change of current produces or induces a back emf which opposes the growth or the increase in the current okay part b asks us to calculate the initial rate of change of current when the switch is closed and this is going to be done from our relationship that the back EMF is minus L di by dt, and we substitute in our nine volts. So our back EMF will be minus nine volts, and our inductance is 0 0.4 Henry's, and we can work out that our rate of change of current is 22.5 amperes per second. Okay, so let's have a look at what we set out to talk about. We've talked about inductors and DC circuits talked about the self-inductance of a coil we've talked about lenses law and looked a little about the factors that change the induced emf in terms of changing the inductance and how that changes how much is produced and the growth and decay of current circuits we've defined inductance and back emf and we've explored using a data logger to capture the changing current over time and then working the inductance out from that information.